Wow, thank you. Dumb stuff, huh? <laughs> Hi, I'm Sue. I'm a very grateful member of the Al-Anon family groups because today I love an alcoholic. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you, Shelly. I want to thank Dale for inviting us in the committee. And uh, I want to thank Shelly for being a friend this weekend. Um, and I want to thank Kathy. Hi, Kathy. I met Kathy a few years ago in Las Vegas, and uh, she called me this last week and said, I want to hook up with you this weekend. And so uh, you know, I want to thank John for picking us up at the airport and when we didn't know where to go. We called Kathy, and she's not even on the committee. <laughs> and she knew where we were staying. So al I don't know how you, the alcoholics don't get lost <laughs> without us. But you always find home, huh? <laughs> so anyway, thank you all. Thank you for the basket. Uh, we've had a good time. Thank you to the other speakers. Uh, golly, alcoholics like to hear themselves talk a lot, don't they? <laughs> and boy, we got the opportunity to listen to them this weekend. So thank you all very much for all of your, you just a book of knowledge of worthless information most of the time. <laughs> but you get to AA and uh, we thank your wives and most of the time. See, my husband, I hated him when I got this program because I just thought he was mean and crazy. And what I got to understand is uh, he's a human being, he has an illness, and I didn't understand that. And uh, through the years of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, getting older, he's a very wise man. And I respect him a lot today. And I want to say thank you, Becky, for coming with Randy and the crew. There's a newcomer sitting over there. We're going to get her today. And uh, I love newcomers. I love newcomers. Yeah. Uh, Keith and I have a good time with life today. We fought for 15 years, violent, physical, violent life. And uh, when I got to al -Anon, they told me to just bite my tongue and shut up. And so after about three months in Al-Anon, my tongue was about half as long as it was when I got here. <laughs> and uh, what I learned is that uh, my husband's funny. And I love him today. He's my entertainment. He said to me the other day, he's making a smoothie for himself for breakfast, and he splattered it all over the counter. And uh, he wiped it up but it had dribbled down the side of the counter. And I said, are you going to clean that up too? He said, no, I thought you'd do it. I said, no, your mother doesn't live here. And he goes, that's too bad. And I go, why? And he said, because I was going to ask her to go to lunch with me. <laughs> oh, God. And he said last night he liked... Um, to have sex in free rooms, and he didn't let you down last night either. So, <laughs> old age crept up on me in the middle of the night. <laughs> He's kind of like these Walmart things. You can try them after a while. They pop up. <laughs> We're all here because we're not all there. You understand that, right? But there's nothing that I enjoy more than being in a room of recovering people. Because we are who we are because of the disease of alcoholism. And the first time I heard myself laugh was in an AA meeting. And I laughed at an alcoholic. And uh, I went, what's that noise? because I hadn't laughed in years. And uh, I used to sit new in Al-Anon meetings, and we'd hear the AAs in the room next door, and they were laughing and stuff, and the Al-Anons were so serious. 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, what I learned about me is I have a sense of humor. I just had to get through the steps before I had a spiritual awakening and found myself. And that's what the steps did for me. Uh, I didn't come into this program with a lot of self-worth. Uh, I wasn't raised in an alcoholic home. I'm not an adult child. I love it when I, people come into meetings and they want to whine about being an adult child and they're 58 years old. <laughs> I, oh, okay. One of the gals in our group, she has to go home early and fix dinner for her little boy. And we asked her the other day, how old is your little boy? 42. <laughs> That's alcoholism. It's total alcoholism. Yeah. Um, but we laugh at the things that we used to cry about, and that is recovery. That is recovery. And... Uh, like I said, I wasn't raised in an alcoholic home. I was raised in a so-called normal home. My dad worked in the oil fields, and we followed the oil wells around in uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas Panhandle. Lived in a trailer house for many years. And uh, I didn't, I never, when I got, when I first went to an AA meeting with Keith, I uh, identified with the alcoholics that were sharing, and it scared me. I thought, well, maybe I'm an alcoholic. Maybe I'm an alcoholic, because I identify. But what I identified with was the fact that uh, people were talking about a disease of alcoholism. And when he was in detox, it's like, okay, I identify with these alcoholics. And I heard this guy say, if you wonder if you're an alcoholic, go home every night and have one drink for 30 days. And if that's all you have, then you're probably not an alcoholic. So he's in detox, and so I think, okay, yeah. And so I went home that night, and before I went to bed, sat in the chair. I never slept in bed um, because I didn't know where he was and if he was going to sneak up on me or nothing. I needed to be ready. And so he's in detox, and I'm sitting in this chair, and I thought, you know, I wonder if I'm an alcoholic. I'm just going to have a glass of wine. And I'm going to see if I'm an alcoholic. So I sat there in that chair and I watched TV and I drank that glass of wine. I woke up the next morning and it's half full. And I thought, oh my gosh. If I don't drink that whole glass, I'm never going to find out if I'm an alcoholic. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> so I... Uh, the next night I thought, okay, I'll drink a beer. Well, and so I sat down and I drank a few, a little bit of beer, and I woke up the next morning, half the beer's there, and I'm thinking, Jesus, how am I going to find out if I'm an alcoholic if I'm not going to drink this stuff? And then it dawned on me that if I'd been an alcoholic, all the wine would have been gone, all the beer wouldn't have been gone. You know, it, uh, I'm not an alcoholic. And I'm so grateful for that. Because when I was new in Al-Anon, my first sponsor had me read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she had me read it chapter by chapter and write on each chapter what I found out in each chapter and how I related. And I love the doctor's opinion. And if you're new in the program and you haven't read the doctor's opinion, I strongly suggest you do that. Because I did not know why Keith couldn't have one drink. Now, growing up in my parents' home, every once in a while, my parents would pull out a jug of Morgan David wine out from under the cupboard, and they would have a fruit juice glass of wine before they went to bed. And that's all I knew about drinking. I remembered one time... My parents went to a New Year's Eve party, and I, my mom said my dad got drunk. And we lived in a trailer house. We was in Kansas, and it was snowing like crazy. And my dad had to clean all of the junk out from under our trailer house in a blizzard because he got drunk at that New Year's Eve party. So I knew that if you got drunk, you got punished. I remembered that growing up. And so um, 
I identified with alcoholics. They never belonged. They never felt like they belonged anywhere. They had low self-esteem. I identified with all of that kind of stuff because I was called oil field trash a lot. And I went five, six, seven schools in one year. And so all of the feelings that I would hear, I felt. So what I understand today, I have the disease of alcoholism through association with, alco with an alcoholic. But what I also understand today is I believe that God put an alcoholic in my life so I could find Al-Anon, so I could find my God. Because that's what I had to do. That's what I had to do. So growing up, uh, my folks finally settled down in a little town called Perryton, Texas, in the Texas Panhandle, and, um, and we stayed there. My older sisters, four years older than I did, run off, got married, started their own family. Uh, I had a brother seven years younger than I, and then when I was 15 years old, my father passed away with cancer. And that left my mother and my younger brother and I together. And after a period of time, my mom started dating, and I hated her for that because she was being disloyal to my daddy because I was daddy's little girl. And I started looking for love in all the wrong places, and I ended up in San Antonio, Texas, in an unwed mother's home. Because back then, you didn't keep children, and it was a secret that you got rid of them. And so I went there, and I stayed in that home for a while and uh, gave that child up for adoption, went back home, because at that time I wasn't ready, willing, or able to be responsible. And uh, I went back home, and I didn't like the kids that I used to hang out with. They were boring, they were immature. And one night my mom said to me, babe, would you like to go to a honky-tonk with my friends and I? And I said, sure. And uh, so we go, and we walk in, and it's a place kind of like this. The band is loud. There's smoke all over the place. You can't hardly see through it. People are fighting, and they're dancing, and I'm home. I love every minute of it. And pretty soon, I watched this cowboy move the room, and everywhere he went, there was a fight starting. Now, I thought it took a lot of courage to do what he was doing. <laughs> and he ran past me and hit, went in the woman's restroom and he said, honey, let me know when the fight's over. And I said, okay. So I was a good pre al anon I'd been di given direction, so I stood on duty. And when the fight was over, I said, hey, cowboy, you can come out now. And he came out and he asked me for the last dance. And the last dance is usually a slow dance where you rub up against each other and get ready to go home. But it was a fast dance. And it kept getting faster and faster and faster. And we never missed a lick. And I loved it. And as I look back on that, what I understand today is he got me downtown in the fast lane right now. I'd never met anybody like that before. He called me the next day and asked me out. My mother said, no, you're not going with him. He's been married before. He's been in jail. He's older than you. He's in trouble all the time. And I said, OK. <laughs> he came and picked me up. The doorbell rang. I go to the door. And we go outside, and there's no car. I go, now, wait a minute. My dates pick me up in cars. He said, you don't understand. I've lost my driver's license forever, and I totaled my car. And I said, no problem. <laughs> so I got him in my car, and I knew what to do. I took him to the drive-in movie, and uh, we set that movie, and we watched the movie. Now, I know how to kiss and smooch and steam up the windows and all that kind of stuff, and he wasn't doing that. And I looked over at him, and he's got a six-pack of beer sitting between his legs that he's more interested than me. And that set up that obsession. I want to be number one in that man's life. And that obsession about killed me for the next 15 years. Keith and I dated for two years. Uh, he wouldn't mind. He, uh, he wouldn't do stuff I'd tell him to. 
And my girlfriends were saying, uh, and we'd have fights over that kind of stuff. I'd, we'd go to park and he wouldn't be talking to me and saying the stuff he should be saying to me. I'd jerk the keys out of the car and throw them out in the vacant lot and he'd have to go find them. And he'd come back in the car and he'd be so angry. And uh, he'd start yelling at me, I'd start yelling at him and I'd whack him and he'd whack me back and I'd start kicking and, and uh, he'd say, you're going home. And he'd take me home, I'd walk in the door, I got a black eye and my mother would say, what do you do to that man to make him treat you that way? I said, what do I do to him? Look at what he did to me. I was always the victim. I came to Al-Anon to find out there are no victims, we're only volunteers. And I volunteered for every bit of it. And uh, my girlfriend said that their boyfriends came over and doted on them in the middle of the week. They watched TV and they'd smooch on the couch and stuff. And I wanted my boyfriend to do that, but he was coming over to my house and he was falling asleep, I thought, on the couch. I didn't understand, pass out. And at that time, Keith had long hair and a long beard. And I looked at him one night and I thought, he will never do this to me again. He doesn't know who this is. Self-righteous. I will show him the sweet taste of revenge. And I went and got a razor and I shaved half his head and half his face off. <laughs> and he got up off that couch and uh, kissed me goodbye and went home. Next night he came back to take me out on a date and he looked the same. And we'd drag Main Street. We'd go down Main Street this way, and he'd be clean shaven and clean hair. And we'd go back down there, long hair and a long beard. And he'd say, people in this town think I'm two-faced anyway. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we dated for two years. And uh, he got a draft notice, and we decided we couldn't live without each other. So we took my mother and her boyfriend, and we ran off to Amarillo to get married. And uh, the next week he went and took his draft physical and Uncle Sam didn't want him, so I got to keep him. <laughs> and then his parents and I decided that what he needed to do is go back to school. And he'd gone to school for many years, but he never stayed put long enough to get a degree. And I knew what I had to make him stay put. That's all he needed to do, stay put. And so we moved to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and Keith enrolled in school. Shortly after that, we had our little girl, Simone, and I remember when they handed me that little girl saying, thank God she's a girl. Because Keith was a drunk, his dad was a drunk, and his granddad was a town drunk. I didn't know that alcoholism doesn't care what sex, color, race, or creed you are. It takes you to the gates of insanity and hell, and you don't even have to drink booze to get there. And as he started drinking, we, we'd go to those honky-tonks, and I'd put him in a booth. I'd have to go to the restroom. We'd be dancing. I'd put him in a booth, and I'd say, stay. <laughs> and I'd come out of the restroom, and there'd be a fight going. And I'd given him the lecture before we don't fight tonight. And I'd go out, and there'd be a big fight. And I'd push my way through all of those guys, and somebody would hit me and knock me down. And they'd go, where did she come from? And they'd pull me up, and I'd be cussing them and, and doing all kinds of things to them. And I'd look over, and Keith's in the booth. He never got out of that booth. I never knew what he was going to do or not do. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. And every time I thought I had it figured out, he had already moved on to something else. That's what made me crazy. Is because I know I got the answers to what happened yesterday, but I didn't know what was coming today. And I couldn't second guess an alcoholic. It took Keith four years to get a two-year degree, and I took all the credit. Because he couldn't have done it without me. And uh, he came home, and he said, Babe, I want to move to California. And I said, Not going to California. Too wild and crazy out there. We'll never raise children in California. He said, Babe, you don't understand. We've been going to all these honky-tonks, and we're, you're drinking out of paper sacks, and you getting fights. You, me, getting fights in these honky-tonks, and I did. 
There was a gal flirting with Keith one night, and you don't flirt with my man, and I knocked her through a plate glass window. <laughs> and she came back about six weeks later and said, look at my face. They had to take skin off my hip to fix my face. And the kind of person I was is I had no guilt or remorse about that. And I just looked at her and I said, now your name is Buttface and it fits you. <laughs> That's the kind of person I was before I got here. So he's telling me if I go to California, you can go to a restaurant and order a cocktail. They mix it for you. You won't get drunk. You can have it right before dinner like you're supposed to have. And we'll be good out there. And I'm going, yeah. So we hurried up and packed all of our stuff. And uh, Keith made this big trailer, sprayed it bright blue, and put all of our junk in it, and we head for California. And it was crazy in that car. We had a station wagon. We laid the back down. We had a cat and German Shepherd and some mom back there. And uh, the dog would wait behind the driver's seat to chase big trucks down the side. And he'd hit the back and it'd knock him down. He'd be on the cat. They'd have a dog and cat fight. Someone would start crying. I'd turn around and I'd start whacking and bitching. And Keith would start drinking. And we did that one day at a time for 30 days. <laughs> because he didn't know where we were. <laughs> he wouldn't ask nobody. He said, if I ask where we're at, they're no well lost. No, we can't tell people I'm lost. We finally made it to California. And he started working, and he'd be gone. He worked in the oil fields in California. He'd be gone for days, and then uh, I'd be standing at the window, and I'd be rehearsing. Uh, when he gets home, I'll say this, and he'll say that. You know, and a little girl stand there saying, Mommy, play with me. And I'd push her aside and I'd say, leave me alone, I'm busy. Because she was interfering with my obsession. This disease takes away the ability for me to be a good parent. Because my obsession is the alcoholic. I believed I thought just as much about his drinking as he thought about his drinking. Who's he with, how much has he drank, and when's he coming home? Constantly, 24-7. And um, we lived like that for years. He'd come home and, and I'd say, where have you been? And we'd go out to dinner. He took me to dinner the first time we went out to dinner. And it was a nice building, brick building. It had cocktail and neon signs. It didn't have roses painted on the window or Shangri-La on a board above a door. It, uh, it was a nice, classy place. And people in there were dressed up. And they looked good. And I want to be like that. You see, I was always judging my insides with your outsides. If I could only feel the way you looked, I'd be OK. And I watched these people, and they had long stem crystal glasses. And they're swishing it, and they're sniffing it. And I didn't know what in the heck they were doing. But if I have that, I'll be OK. And so the waiter came over, and, and he took our order, and he said, would you like wine with your dinner? And we'd had a cocktail. We even had a Shirley Temple for Simone. And Keith had picked up his drink and said, let's toast to the good life. And we toasted to the good life. It's OK now. And so when they brought those wine glasses, we said we wanted wine with our dinner. And they set those crystal glasses down there. I never had anything like that living in a trailer house. And now I'm somebody. And the guy poured Keith just a little bit and said, is it OK? And I looked at that guy and I said, what do you care? He drank stuff in Oklahoma and had stuff floating in it. Poor mine. And they poured mine, and all of my arrogance, I swished that glass, and I sniffed it, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I was, just, I was great, until I look across the table at Keith, and he's drinking out of the carafe. And I go, what are you doing? He said, I'm drinking. What's it look like I'm doing? And Simone says, not here. And she slides under the table. 
and I see the waiter and I holler at the waiter, come here, come here, right now, come here. And I'm yelling. And the waiter comes over to the table and he looks right at me and I don't ever want to forget this. He said, I'm sorry, but you can't eat here. And I said, why not? And he pointed right at me and he said, because you don't know how to act. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand if he doesn't act that way, I won't have to be this way. He doesn't understand. And we're being escorted out and Keith's talking to everybody in sign language so we can never go back. <laughs> and we get home and I get right in his face. Don't you ever act like that again. He said, Sue, get out of my face. And I take one step closer and if you ever act like that again, he said, Sue, if you don't get out of my face, I'm gonna hit you. And I took one step closer and the finger's gone and he hit me and the knockdown drag out fight was on. And he had me on the bed and I was laying there and he was choking the living tar out of me. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die right here. And he looked at me, I looked up at him and he's looking down at me with all the intensity he has. And it dawned on me. He's not thinking about nothing but me. I am number one in his life. All I ever wanted was 100% of his attention. And so I started those fights all the time because that's the only way I could get 100% of his attention. I talked a few years ago, I talked at a meeting over in West LA and after the meeting, this lady came up to me and she said, oh my gosh, my husband and I fight like that all the time. And I said, you're in his face, aren't you? And she said, no, I'm not. I don't get in his face, but he has to hit me and we fight like that all the time. She said, he's over in his first AA meeting. Can I go get him and introduce him to you? And I said, sure. So pretty soon here she's come. She's got him by the arm leading him over there. And uh, he stands in front of me and she said, this is my husband. She takes his hand and he pulls it out like that. And I go, what are you doing? She said, he's blind. I said, and you don't get in his face? He's blind. He's got to find you before he hits you. The denial that we live with. And so we started, the, we had those fights all the time. So I could be number one. Keith having a gun, being from Texas, you know, using a gun, I pulled a butcher knife out and I'll show you. And him and I used to fight with a gun and knife all the time. He'd pass out on me and I'd take that knife and I'd go all over his back and I'd say, God, please, please do away with this. I didn't know that this that I was talking about was the disease and in the insanity of alcoholism. And I just back and start to bleed and I'd think, oh my gosh, what, a, what is wrong with me? This is a man that I'm supposed to love. What is wrong with me? And I'd lay down and cry myself to sleep. And like he said last night, you know, he'd wake up and say, oh my God, my, what's wrong with my back? And I'd say, you broke out with acne in the back. But I'll get the rubbing alcohol and I'll fix it. You know, and uh, I loved it. I loved it. We had a fight one night. And uh, he didn't come home and that wasn't his pattern. Now I would call the cops or Simone would call the cops or the neighbors would call the cops every time we'd have our fights. And now, uh, you know, they were at our house all the time. And they'd arrest him and they'd put him in jail and I'd go down and I'd write a hot check to bail him out. And I got, I got arrested for hot checks to the county. And, uh, and then I'd call his dad because his dad was a drunk. And I'd say, I just wrote a hot check to get Keith out of jail because he's, you got to send me the money to cover that check because he's just like you. And his dad would always send me that money. His dad was on my eight step list and I did do a ninth step with my father-in-law. Love that man. Anyway, um, 
He didn't come home after we had the fire that night, and that wasn't Keith's pattern. It's like, he can't do this to me. I'm going to go find him. We got up the next morning, I'm going to go find him. I didn't have a clue of where I was going to find him out there, like looking for a needle in a haystack. And I thought, well, we go down to Orange, and we go to this after-hours club every once in a while. It's about 15, 14, 15 miles from our house. I'll go there and start there and see if I can find him. And so we, I get Simone in the car, and we get down there. And a couple of blocks from that place, I see Keith's pickup parked over beside this house. And this house had motorcycles all over the lawn. By then, Keith had become a biker. And I, I didn't like that image the most. And I thought, I'll show him. And I took the keys to the pickup out of my purse. I went over to the pickup, and I drove his pickup two blocks from that house. Then I walked back to my car, and I drove my car two blocks in front of the pickup. Then I walked back to the pickup, and I drove my pickup two blocks in front of that car. <laughs> Only took me four hours to get both of those vehicles home, and I did it, and I felt so good. <laughs> and he called me a few, um, he called me, and he said, Sue, come and get me. And I very arrogantly said, no, let one of your buddies bring you home. He goes, buddies, what are you talking about? And I said, you're over there in those house, that house with those bikers, and you're drinking and using with them. You let one of them bring you home. He said, house? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not at a house. He said, I'm in jail. I go, jail? What are you doing going to jail? You can't go to jail till I call the cops or the neighbors call the cops or Simone calls. You can't just go out there and go to jail all by yourself. <laughs> and he's going, whatever. <laughs> and so I get in the car and Simone and I, we go down and I write a hot check and I, I bail him out. We go get in the car, and Simone says, Mommy, we got to get Daddy. And I said, No, we're not going to get your Daddy. We bailed him out, and he's got to find his own way home because he doesn't love you, and he doesn't love me, or he wouldn't act like that. Putting him down to his own daughter. You see, I thought love had everything to do with it. I didn't know it was a disease. I didn't know he couldn't have one drink and not stop. I didn't understand. And so a couple hours later, the doorbell rings. I go open the door, and there's Keith. I go, what do you want? And he introduces himself to me like I didn't know. This is Keith Drum, you know, I live here. I go, not anymore. And he said, Sue, please let me in. I said, no, if you want in, you beg. You beg if you want in. And that man would get on his knees, and he begged me to get back into his own home. Robbing that man of his dignity. And we think that it's the drinker that has the problem. You see, I don't ever want to forget where I came from. I don't ever want to forget the woman that I was. Because in, I went to an attorney, and he shared this story last night about the attorney told me to take him to AA. And uh, I didn't know what that was. He said, that's a place where people go to stop drinking. It's like, yeah. I got the answer. And I went home, and I said, you're going to go to AA. And he said, oh, I checked it out today, and there's a meeting just down here. And I didn't know he was on a court card. I thought he loved us enough that he could quit drinking. And I took him to that meeting for four months, sitting out in the parking lot with my butcher knife, said, you come out of that door before 10 o'clock, I'll get you. And when I thought he had it down pat, I let him go by himself, and he got drunk immediately, because love doesn't fix alcoholism. I didn't know that there was times that he drank because he did love us. We have to educate ourselves on the disease of alcoholism if we're going to be supportive of the sober alcoholics in our lives. 
We had many, many fights after that, and after he went to Alcoholics Anonymous, the anger was stronger and the fights were more violent. And what I know is that I had to hit a bottom, just like the alcoholic did. Where I took him to go to those AA meetings in that church, there was an Al-Anon meeting in there the exact same time, the exact same night, but I hadn't got to the want to. I know that this program's for people who want it. A lot of people need it, but until you get to the want to, it won't work. That's why we see newcomers coming in and out all the time. You know, in Al-Anon, there's a lot of newcomers coming in and out, especially in Las Vegas. They want relief. Relief is not the answer. I had to get in recovery. I had relief for four months when Keith didn't drink, but that didn't stop my insanity. He'd come home to an old idea because I was right in his face because he didn't pay this bill or he would, you know, I didn't trust him where he had been or what he'd been doing and I was right like this. And I couldn't change. I couldn't change. And I don't ever want to forget the last drunk in our house. I remember Keith had Simone over in the corner doing the things to her that I always did to her. And I remember looking at him and saying, oh my gosh, she's not even a good father anymore. I have no excuses left. And I went over to Keith and I didn't hit him, I didn't stab him, I didn't yell at him, and I didn't cuss. And I just looked at him and very calmly I said, Keith, I don't love you anymore, but I don't hate you either. And if you gotta become a skid row bone, because I thought that's what happened to drunks. That's what you gotta do, but we can't go any further with you. And Simone and I got some things together and we left that house for the very last time. I'm so grateful. Simone needed some things for school and we went back to the house and we was afraid of what we'd find because Keith was always going to commit suicide or he's shooting our pets or whatever. And we didn't know what to expect. And we went in the house and it was dark and we looked around. We found him face down on the bedroom floor. We thought he was dead, so we kicked him. <laughs> And he rolled over and he looked at me and he said, Sue, please help. And I know this is when God came into my life because he gave me the most important word I've ever said to that man. No. No, I can't help you. If you want help, you help yourself. I don't know where those words came from. Keith got up off the floor and he made some phone calls. To Alcoholics Anonymous, thank God. We had to fight with a gun and a knife one more time because that's who we are. Doorbell rang and this little short gray-headed man standing at the door. And I said, Jesus, why don't they send the big ones on these trips? <laughs> and he did the classic 12-step call that it talks about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He 12-stepped the family of and he asked me to go with him, put Keith in a detox. And we had to take him to two or three, four places before he found a place where Keith, they would accept him. Because I told him, you came and got him, he's yours. He ain't coming home. You better find some place. You said you know where to take him. You better take him there. And, uh, and we found the detox and they took Keith because of Dr. Paul. And little Jack took me back home and he sat in the driveway and he said, you need a program called Al-Anon. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. If Keith was drinking, I'll be fine. He said, no, you won't. He said, you're the meanest, most foul-mouthed woman I've ever met. <laughs> he said, and you need help. And Al-Anon can help you. He said, let's go in the house and talk to Simone. And he went in there and he told Simone, if you love your daddy, the only way you can help him is go to a program called Alateen. And we started going. And Keith was in that detox and he came home and he said, uh, I gotta go to a meeting every day for the rest of my life. What are you doing? I'm going to Al-Anon, the kid's going to Alateen, the dog's going to Alley Dog, and the cat's going to Alley Cat, so what? <laughs> And 
because I wasn't as sick as him, I only went to one meeting a week. <laughs> and after six weeks, he wasn't home when he was supposed to be. He wasn't minding. <laughs> and he's sober. And he better start minding if he's going to be sober. <laughs> and I thought, well, he's probably out of coffee with some sober alcoholics, but who cares? And I thought, God, I can't do this. I got to calm myself down. I remembered in Al-Anon meetings, they say, be good to yourself. And I thought, I'm going to take a warm bath and try to relax. And to remember some of the things I hear in these meetings. And I did. And I sat there, oh my God, I had the most brilliant idea. Key set a coffee shop with at least six sober alcoholics. I could kill him now, and he'd have pallbearers. <laughs> That's how well I was getting on one meeting a week. <laughs> Keith came home, and I was right in his face. Where have you been? What have you been doing? He said, Sue, get out of my face. And I took one step closer. And he did the most, he said the most devastating thing to me he had ever said to me. Sue, get out of my face. I can't hit you anymore and stay sober. My sobriety comes first. You're going to have to fix yourself. Oh, my God. I went crazy. I ran down the hall, and I went in the bathroom. I whirled around, and I slammed the door shut, and I looked in the mirror, and the words came to me, and I know it was my God talking to me. I saw a crazy woman in that mirror, and I heard the words, one meeting a week is not going to fix you. We can sit here. We cannot get this through osmosis. I went back to that meeting, and I asked the lady that had been there forever, and there was the meanest lady in the room to be my sponsor. She had 18 years in recovery. And she said, I will sponsor you if you'll do exactly what I tell you to do. Oh, my God. Newcomers today go, oh, you're going to tell me what to do? I heard that true surrender is a willingness to do it someone else's way. And I wanted answers. I wanted recovery. I wanted good. And I was willing. And that lady told me, she said, well, let's talk about this. It was on a Friday night. She said, call me at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, that's Saturday. You always sleep in on Saturdays. And she looked at me and she said, you got to get up to work a program. Isn't that amazing? I was up at 5.30 waiting for it to click on 6. She said, I will sponsor you. You will call me every day as a at a designated time because you have no discipline in your life. And we're going to make you accountable. She said, when you get up, you're going to say, good morning, God. Here I am. You're going to open your one day at a time book and you're going to read today's page because that's the only one we had then. Now we have hope for today and courage to change, and I read those. She said, then you're going to go to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're going to turn to the page where it says, On Awakening, and you're going to read the rest of that chapter. Then you're going to go to the page that says the third step prayer on it, and she's showing me all of this in her big book. And you're going to read the third step prayer, and then she flipped it back, and she goes, and you're going to read this. This is a seventh-step prayer. And then you can add any prayers to it that you want to. Then you're going to go in the bathroom. You're going to look in the mirror, and you're going to say, Good morning, Sue. I love you. And that was the hardest part of all. But I'll tell you something. I remember the day I looked in that mirror. And there was a lady looking back at me that loved me. I don't know when it happened, but it did. I had to collect eight hugs at every meeting because I didn't like people. And she said that this is a program of love. 
and I'd collect my eight hugs and I'd tell her, I remember telling her, okay, I feel good here now, but I don't feel this way at home. She said, we don't care if you're wonderful for an hour, an hour and a half in your meetings. You got sick at home, that's where you take recovery. You're going to go home tonight and you're going to hug Keith. I said, I want it. She said, I don't care. I go, wait a minute, all the signs in these places say we care. <laughs> she said, I don't care about hurting your feelings. You're going to get well. Feelings are not facts. We're going to get into the actions. I said, okay. So I went home, and pretty soon I hear the door open and shut. And I, I know Keith's coming down the hall. I can hear him, and I'm going, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And he gets up beside me. I put my arm around him, and I hug him. And he goes, what's that for? I said, just for the hell of it, they told me to do it. Don't ask me why. <laughs> and I had to go in every morning, and I had to get up earlier in the morning to get ready for work because Simone and I fought in the bathroom so bad, and so I had to get up early, get in the bathroom, get ready, and then kiss her goodbye and let her get ready for school by herself in the bathroom. And so uh, I'd kiss her every morning. And I'd tell her goodbye, have a good day. And one morning I was in a hurry and I got to work and she called me and she goes, Mom, are you mad at me? And I said, no, why? She said, because every morning when I get up, I look in the mirror and I see your lipstick print on my face and I know you care about me now. <laughs> it's called family recovery. It's called doing the opposite of what we want to do. It doesn't matter if it feels good. It never feels good in the beginning. But it is for the good. I have to change my habits and my patterns to have a good life. My sponsor said, I'm going to tell you something, because I was always testing. She said, I want you to make your bed every day for 90 days. I want you to change a bad habit. And if you miss a day, you got to start your 90 days over. I said, okay. Do you know today, I cannot leave my bed unmade. So if that works, why can't it work with the way I feel? Why can't it work with my discipline of going to meetings? I found out, like I told you, one meeting a week won't fix me. I go four or five meetings a week because I want to get better. I found out, my sponsor had me write every one of those steps, and when I got to the sixth step, I found out that impatience and greed was my biggest character defects. So if I'm impatient and I want more, I better go to more meetings. Because the more I go, the better I get. And then she said I had to give it away after I got through those steps. And so I started romancing newcomers. And Keith was working out of town a lot and stuff. And so, you know, I'd go the Saturday night A speak of me, and I'd ask this newcomer to come. I said, come. You know, I'll save you a seat because you need to go to an AA meeting because my sponsor told me I needed to go to at least one AA speaker meeting a week so I'd hear other alcoholics talk so I'd know I didn't live with the only crazy sucker in town. <laughs> and so I asked this newcomer to come that night and I'd meet her there and I'd save her a seat. And, and I was sitting with my sponsor and here comes this newcomer. I go, there she is, there she is. And I go, come on, come on. And I got your seat right here. And this newcomer comes over to me, and she goes, I don't want to sit there. I go, why not? She goes, because I don't like you. <laughs> oh, my God. I thought that when we all got in the same place, we had to like each other. But in our closing, it says we love each other in a very special way. And that's what this is all about, is the identity and the love of God putting us together where we can identify with each other and we can get better. Like he shared last night, Simone grew up, and uh, she grew up in Alateen, made the transition into Al-Anon, and uh, she followed a dream.
She wanted to become a model and she wanted to go to Italy. She did. We were involved in service and all kinds of stuff. And, and that gave her the courage to follow a dream. And so we took her to L.A. and she went to Milan, Italy. We didn't hear from her for six weeks. We were on our knees every night, praying together, saying there is no spot where God is not. God doesn't have grandkids. She's God's kid. He's taking care of her. And then there was a guy that had been in an AA meeting with Keith that he was a photographer and into modeling and stuff, and he called us. And he'd been in Italy, and Simone had showed up in a meeting. And he took her and showed her around where the agencies were and everything. And he called us when he got home and said, Simone's okay. And she started going to Al-Anon, and it wasn't like she was used to. She was a, literally a pioneer there. And she started helping translate literature into, in, into Italian, AA and Al-Anon literature. She started doing 12-step work over there, and she started things like this over there. She has a woman's conference. She started Alateen over there. And she's very humble. If she was standing here right now, I mean, she's a very successful model over there. But if she's standing here right now, she would tell you about the challenges that she had in the program and how she got through that. And she's a long timer over there now. There was some ladies that called the other day, one of the girls in our groups from Czechoslovakia, and she had helped some ladies in Czechoslovakia one Christmas start an al meeting over there, and they called and they wanted to go to Simone's Woman's Conference. There is no spot where God is not. Simone uh, met a very nice Italian man, doesn't drink or use, He's normal, I guess. First time I went over there when she had Nicole, our oldest granddaughter. I was there, and I was in the hallway, and I turned on the light switch, and the light bulb blew out. And I asked Simone, you got a ladder? I, I can change the light bulb for you. And she said, no, Fabio, who's her husband, he'll change it when he gets home. And I said, oh, yeah? She said, yeah. OK. So I watched. <laughs> when Fabio come home, he went and turned the light, and he flicked it a couple of times. And he walked off, and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> he comes back with a ladder and a new light bulb. And he puts it in. They didn't have to go two weeks without a light bulb. <laughs> that must be a normal home. <laughs> huh? Whoa. And then, you know, Simone had, you know, when Nicole was old enough, she brought her over to America. And Simone's in-laws are very proper Italians. And Simone started telling Nicole, this is grandmama and grandpapa. And Nicole, she she just, she knew three languages when she finally grew up. She knew English, Italian, and Nicole. And I knew all of them. I mean, she got in bed with us one night. Simone had gone to see her sponsor. and We'd babysit for her. And Nicole got in bed with us, and she's laying there, and she's going, Granny, latte, latte. So I get up, and I fix her bottle. And I come back in, and I give her a bottle. And Keith goes, how'd you know what she wanted? I said, haven't you ever been to Starbucks? <laughs> There's all kinds of things that we do that teach us stuff. But then when she came home and she wanted to name us, what's she going to call us? We got in the house and it was cold outside. It was Christmas time and Keith went and put on a jacket and he was going to go to his AA meeting. And he's kissing us goodbye. And Nicole runs to him and she grabs him by the leg and she goes, no, Pappy, no. And we're going, oh my gosh, you're Pappy. And he holds her, and he kisses her, and he said, yes, I'm your pappy. And he goes to his AA meeting, and I tell Simone, I said, OK, Simone, take her in the other room, and I'll get my coat.
And uh, <laughs> I get my cup and I go, chow, chow. She goes, chow, chow. <laughs> but before she left, I was granny. And I'm the best granny in the world. I know how to be a granny. It's the easiest job ever. And Nicole and I bonded, oh my gosh. And it doesn't mean that she, I spoiled the hell out of her. We went to Payless Shoe Store when she was a couple years old and she wanted an umbrella because it had some kind of one of those things at the bottom, character that little kids like on the bottom of the umbrella. And we didn't need an umbrella. We got our tennis shoes with those things on it, with those pictures on it. No, Granny, I'm, I want this, I want this, I want this. And I go, no. And she throws herself down on the ground and she starts screaming and kicking and, Granny, I want this. I go, chow chow. And so I go outside and I tell Simone, go ahead and look for what you're looking for and I'll take her, she'll come outside with me. So we go outside and she's in my face, Granny, I want, and I'd turn my back on her. And she'd run around in front of me, Granny, I want this, and these people walk by and I said, she's my granddaughter, she's just having a tantrum, okay? And so we get in the car, I told Simone, one of her girlfriends came in there and I said, why don't you ride home with her and I'll go ahead and take Nicole home. She said, okay, and so we get in the car and Nicole's still crying and screaming and throwing her tantrum. And I put it, turn on the radio and, and so I start singing with the radio, you know. And I said, I love you, Nicole. And I'm singing the tunes and she's going, no musica, Granny, no musica. I go, I love you, Nicole. And I just keep singing with the radio. And pretty soon she goes, Granny, excuso, Granny, excuso, I love you. That little girl at two and a half, three years old knew how to make amends. Isn't that amazing? She grew up, you know, they were at the beach and this, she's playing with these toys and these kids ran off and left their toys there. And these kids' grandma came over and told Nicole, these are my kids' buckets and shovels, they're mine. And Nicole says, I'm just playing with them. And the lady went to pick them up. She kicked sand in Nicole's face. And Nicole said, my granny is from America. And that lady says she didn't care if her granny was from America or Italy or Germany or wherever. Yeah. But that little girl intuitively knew if I'd been there, I could have kicked that lady's ass. <laughs> <laughs> and she's grown up she's uh, 14 years old now they had Jasmine she's 7 years old and we're the best grandparents they've ever, anybody's ever had I love being a grandparent there's no words to explain the feeling and when Simone called us when she was 12 years old and she said, Nicole's going through a really hard time. She's getting big breasts. And kids are, she feels self-conscious and she doesn't like it. And I said, uh, can I talk to her? And Simone goes, sure. And Nicole and I both liked Lady Gaga. So Nicole gets on the phone and I said, uh, Nicole, you have a big chest. She goes, oh, see, Granny, bad, bad. And I said, no, baby. You stand tall, you put your shoulders back, and you be proud, because that's a part of Granny that you got. <laughs> and you be proud, because, baby, we were born this way. And Simone said a few nights later, they were out to dinner, and a lady walked in that had big chest. And Fabio went to say something, and Nicole goes, no, no, Papa, she was born that way. These kids have a life that our daughter couldn't have. But our daughter learned enough in our home and through you that maybe, just maybe, the chain's been broken. 
Keith and I have been fortunate enough to be able to get a retirement home in Las Vegas and we're back and forth. And al sucked over there when I started there, in my opinion. They were dump meetings. Everybody was dumping, dumping, dumping. And I sat in a meeting one night and I said, God, this isn't recovery. I'm used to strong program. And if I'm going to be here, I've got to have it. Please help me. And I sat there, and I remembered being in a meeting in Amarillo, Texas, with a long-timer by the name of Arbutus O'Neill. And she had very, very strong program. One, one of my mentors. And I remember that, that, that we went to this meeting, and Arbutus just shot up, crusty old bird. And she said, Al-Anon is not a garbage can. You don't come here to dump your garbage. You come here, you get a sponsor, and you have, go through the steps. And when you have a, a problem, you work through it with a sponsor. You reason it out, and you find out which step is a solution to your problem. And then you go share it in a meeting of Al-Anon, the process you've gone through, because that's what gives newcomers hope. And I remember that, and I'm thinking, oh, God, I can't do this. And so somebody else shares. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, oh, gosh. And I remember it again. And I go, okay, God, I'll do it, but help me be nice. <laughs> and so when it came my turn to share, I said, you know what? This isn't an al -Anon meeting. At that time, I had 32 years in al -Anon. I said, I know what Al-Anon is, and I know what Al-Anon is not. And this is not Al-Anon. You come in here, and you're dumping your garbage, and I guess you pick it up and take it home with you every week because you come back the next week, and you give us an update. That's not Al-Anon. You're getting sicker in here. And then I repeated what Arbutus had said about how you work a program. And I said, I know I probably pissed some of you off in here, but I don't care. I need recovery. And I went home, and I thought, oh, shoot. Well, next week it comes around, and I think I've got to go to that meeting again. I went to every meeting in the directory of the meetings in Las Vegas to find out the meetings that I wanted to go to. One meeting, they were using women who love too much. And I called my sponsor and reported them. And my sponsor said, you're not the Al-Anon police. <laughs> so I didn't go to that meeting anymore. So the next Tuesday, I went back to that meeting. And the little girl leading the meeting said, you know what? I heard what Sue said last week. And tonight, I want to lead out of the One Day at a Time book. And I went, thank you, God. Some girls over there were attracted to my program, and they wanted to start my home group in California. It's called the Gatawana Group, 12 and 12, 12 Steps, 12 Tradition Study. They wanted to start that in Las Vegas. We have a six-year-old meeting called Gatawana 12 and 12 in Las Vegas. That's how I met Kathy. And uh, a guy came up to me the other day, and it's been we've been there about eight years or so, and the guy along... An older guy in Allen came up to me a couple of Saturdays ago, and he said, Sue, i got to tell you something. He said, uh, I was talking to some people the, last week, and they said that since you've been here, that it seems like everybody has to have a sponsor, and that everybody has to go through the steps, and that everybody has to get a home group, and that you have to go to two or three meetings a week before you can get well. And they said that they liked it better the way it was before you got here. Now, I think he thought he, was, thought he was putting me down. And I just looked at him, and I said, you know what? Go tell they. They give me too much power because God's in charge. That's what we're doing here. We fill up our buckets. Because we have a responsibility to our God to carry the message of recovery to every meeting we sit in. And if you can't do that, God have mercy on your soul. Because 12-step work is what it's all about. 
I love my God because he gave me you. Thank you for helping me and my family.